have your copy of God's Word, I want to invite you to turn to Psalm 19. We have this week and next week to conclude our summer in the Psalms. Uh, I've really enjoyed this season just to walk through the songs of Jesus, as they are sometimes referred to. Uh, walk through these, these psalms, the songbook of Israel, and see how it teaches us and instructs us about our Savior. So Psalm 19 is our text today. I will read all 14 verses. Let's give attention to the reading of the Word of God today. To the choir master, a psalm of David. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims His handiwork. Day to day pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words, whose voice is not heard. Their voice goes out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them he has set a tent for the sun, which comes out like a bridegroom leaving his chamber, and like a strong man runs its course with joy. Its rising is from the end of the heavens, and its circuit to the end of them. And there is nothing hidden from its heat. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned. In keeping them, there is great reward. Who can discern his errors? Declare me innocent from hidden faults. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. This is the word of God. Let's pray together and ask for wisdom as we consider it together today. Lord, we praise you once again for your word. Lord, I I thank you for the simple fact that we can gather in a place like this and read your word aloud. Lord, that we might benefit from hearing it. Lord, as the word is preached today, may you impress its truths upon our hearts. Change our hearts, Lord. Conform us to your image. Lord, as you have revealed yourself to us, Lord, might we see you. Give us sight, give us ears to hear, and give us hearts that long to obey you, Lord. And I pray above all things that your word be heard today and not my own, that you receive all the glory. In the name of Christ, I pray these things. Amen. I was very fortunate whenever I was in college, one of the summers in between semesters, I worked for a summer in the Rocky Mountains in Estes Park, Colorado, the gateway to Rocky Mountain National Park. And I worked across the street on a horse ranch uh, from a mountain called Long's Peak. Long's Peak is the tallest mountain in Rocky Mountain National Park. And when I was there, I had the opportunity to climb this mountain. It's a 15-mile hike. It ascends one mile in elevation standing at 14,259 feet. And to climb this mountain, you must begin long before the sun ever comes up. You have to start hiking about 2 o'clock in the morning so that you can make it off of the summit by noon because at noon every day, thunderstorms roll in. And it is very unwise to be above the tree line during a thunderstorm. So I began to hike at 2 o'clock in the morning hiking by headlamp, by flashlight, walking through the woods, ascending each step higher and higher. And about 7 o'clock in the morning, after the sun had begun to arise, I got to see a glorious sunrise that morning above the tree line. I was on the final stretch of the hike, and I sat down to drink some water, and I looked up, and there was the moon. I remember it distinctly, just 
full and bright, just setting over the horizon, looking down on me. Long's Peak was the highest I had ever been on planet Earth, not in an airplane. And yet, the moon and the sun, infinitely higher than I could ever be. So high above me, desperately out of reach. And I sat there that day and I was reminded of the truth of this psalm. That the heavens themselves declare the glory of God. Each time you look up at the sky or admire a sunrise or a sunset, you are not simply observing a natural phenomenon. You are seeing a proclamation of the glory of God. What we are seeing that God is high above us, transcendent and yet present everywhere that our eyes can see. There's nowhere you can go to escape the presence of the heavens while you walk upon the earth. And there's nowhere we can go to escape the presence of our God. The psalm tells us God is revealed in creation, but it also tells us another way that God is revealed, which is by his very word, by the scriptures. That is, the word of God helps us to make sense of the world of God. God has given us two great gifts, two books, if you will, one in creation and the other in his word, and he reveals himself to us in both. main idea in our text today is that God transforms His people through revealing Himself to them. There's two great things God has given His people to understand Him. Natural revelation in what is seen in the created world and special revelation in what is seen in His Word. And He's given us both of those books that we might be transformed, conformed to His image, to live more faithfully before Him. Notice first in our text today that God reveals himself to us through nature. Look at verse 1. The heavens declare the glory of God. The sky above proclaims his handiwork. Each time you step outside and you look up at the clouds or at the sun, you are seeing the heavens preach a sermon. God's glory, his supremacy, his power are on display every time the heavens are beheld by the human eye. The sky above proclaims God's handiwork. That is, the heavens are a finely crafted, finely tuned piece of work. You think about Jesus being the son of a carpenter. We, we love to observe master carpentry. You know, wood that is shaped and fashioned to fit together to make something beautiful, something functional. That we see the hand of the master whenever we observe good craftsmanship. Well, the Lord is an expert craftsman. And his handiwork is always available for us to admire. All we have to do is look up. Verse 2 tells us that God speaks in creation. Look there in your, in your copy of God's word. Day to day pours out speech. And night to night reveals Knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words whose voice is not heard. That means God is pouring forth speech. He's pouring forth knowledge in the heavens and the earth, but the heavens and the earth don't speak words. Charles Spurgeon says it like this. The witnesses above cannot be slain or silenced. From their elevated seats, they constantly preach the knowledge of God, unwed and unbiased by the judgments of man. So even though you don't hear the sun or the moon or the stars speak to you, be assured they are speaking to you. They are giving knowledge of something, knowledge of their creator. They preach a silent sermon day by day and night by night. And you notice that they reveal something that is to be known. They reveal knowledge. We're not just supposed to know that it's bright outside, or it's dark outside, or it's hot outside, or it's cold outside, or the moon is full, or the moon is gone tonight. We are to know there's a creator who created all of this that we behold, and he is glorious. When you see the sun setting or rising, it's not the beauty of the sun that's being shown to you. It's the beauty and the glory of the creator of the sun. As I was thinking about this, you know, there's always been an attempt to stop or silence Christian preachers from preaching the glory of God. It's always been the case. Read the Old Testament. Read about Moses. Read about Joseph. 
Read about David, Isaiah, and Jeremiah, the prophets who were persecuted. Read about John the Baptist who lost his head for preaching the glory of God. Read about Jesus, crucified on the cross but raised from the dead. Read about the apostles, Peter and Paul. You read church history about martyrs like Polycarp and Justin Martyr. Men like John Huss and Martin Luther, who they sought to kill. You read about men like William Tyndale, who were burned at the stake for translating the Bible into the English language. You read about a man like Jim Elliot, who sought to take the gospel to those who had never heard the name of Jesus but was killed because he wanted to preach the glory of God. There's always been a desire to silence those who would preach the supremacy of God. But as often as that might be the case, you'll never stop the sun from coming up tomorrow. You'll never stop the moon from waxing and waning. They will constantly preach a one-point sermon. God is glorious. We know there is a creator when we look to the heavens. We notice that not only is God's glory being proclaimed at all times, it is being proclaimed in all places every single day. Look at verse 4. Their voice goes out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. The heavens don't speak with audible words, but yet their message is heard every place under the sky of heaven. I think it's one of the reasons why, if you read about ancient cultures, you find it very common in days when the Old Testament, contemporary to when the Old Testament or the New Testament were written, that people often worshipped the sun. And you might, we might look at that as modern people and laugh and say, wow, how ignorant those people were so long ago that they would worship the sun. Don't they know that the sun is just a blazing ball of gas? How silly it is for them to worship the sun. Well, I don't think that's the right attitude for us to take, as if we're a lot smarter than all the people that had gone before us. Because if we didn't have the technological advances that we have today, we might still have people attempting to worship the sun. There's, I think there's a reason why pagan cultures worship the sun. Because they knew it was proclaiming glory. They knew that it was powerful. They knew that it was something that should draw them to worship, but they didn't know who to worship. Pagan cultures might have worshipped the wrong deity, but they knew that the sun directed them to worship. Worship is not to be directed towards the sun, but towards the one who created the sun, who hung the sun and moon and stars in the heavens. Look at the third line of verse 4. It says, In them, that is, in the heavens, he has set a tent for the sun, which comes out like a bridegroom leaving his chamber, and like a strong man runs its course with joy. Its rising is from the ends of the heaven, and its circuit to the end of them, and there is nothing hidden from its heat. It's a poetic way of saying the sun shines everywhere, every day. And I know some of you are saying, well, have you been to Alaska those certain times of the year? You know, it's dark a lot of the day. You still get the picture, right? Creation, the created order is still going on. The sun rules the day and the moon rules the night, as Genesis tells us. And the end of verse 4 tells us the heavens are like a tent where the sun does its work. The, the, The sun is hung up in the sky to go from one end of the heavens to the other, day by day. East to west. It happens time and time again. And the psalmist says that each time the sun makes its course, it's like a bridegroom leaving its chamber. Picture a groom on his wedding day. After he's gotten dressed, right? Not when he shows up to the church in his like socks, his crocs, right? And his shorts and he goes and gets ready. No, he's got his, he's got his tie tied. He's got his hair combed. He's got his suit. Just the top button button. You leave the bottom one unbuttoned, right, gentlemen? You never button all three. He's dressed to the nines. He's ready to do what he came there to do. He's ready to marry his bride. Notice the sun rises each and every day, ready to do its job. Ready to proclaim the glory of God. You notice the second analogy there, that the sun is like a strong man running his course with joy. The idea there is that the sun is doing exactly what it was created to do. Just like a strong man would train and train and train to run a race, so that when he runs the race, there is joy in the running. So the sun joyously proclaims the glory of God day by day because that's what it was created to do. And the sun never gets tired on its journey from east to west. It runs its course with joy 
It doesn't reluctantly proclaim the Creator, but proclaims His glory with joyful obedience to the one who created it. Verse 6 tells us the sun always makes its way from east to west. And it does so proclaiming the greatness of God so that everyone underneath the sun's rays can learn of the Creator. The sun should lead us to consider our Creator. Nothing is hidden from the sun's heat and so no one is without testimony to the Creator. St. Augustine Several hundred years ago, over a millennia ago, he wrote this. He wrote, Earth and the heavens also proclaim that they did not create themselves. We exist, they tell us, because we were made. And this is proof that we did not make ourselves. For to make ourselves, we should have had to exist before our existence began. The Bible is very clear that God created the heavens and the earth. You see that from the first verse of the Bible. And that's an important thing for us to understand because if God has created the heavens and the earth by his voice out of nothing, that there was nothing and then God spoke and there was something, then we are to understand the creation around us in relationship to our creator, not just arbitrarily to distance it from the handiwork of the master. This is what we might call the light of nature. Theologians use that terminology. That is, every person knows intrinsically there is something greater than themselves. And more than that, we can look at the natural world around us and know that some things just are ordered in such a way to make sense. They just are ordered according to the light of nature. There's fundamental truths in our created world, hardwired into our existence, that point to the fact that there is a creator. So the sun does not testify to its own beauty. It shows God's majesty. And the beauty of nature tells us that the works of God make sense. They bring about human flourishing. That is, if we would submit to the Creator's rules for the way in which the world is supposed to run, human beings would flourish. Things would go well. But we all know the problem with this is that we are sinners. So we don't want to hear what God has to say about how His world is to be run. We want to do our own thing. We want to make ourselves to be God. The Apostle Paul elaborates on this idea in Romans 1. He writes this in Romans 1 verse 20 says, for his invisible attributes, that is God's invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools." And exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Psalm 19 gives us a positive vision for contemplating the created order. Romans 1 applies the same principle negatively. David is telling us God is the creator and all creation sings his glory. He's using natural creation as an encouragement to worship the creator. But Paul is saying those who do not give praise... To the Creator, after looking at the works of the heavens, are actually in sin. Friends, Romans was written millennia ago. And we still live in a Romans 1 world. We might not worship idols or worship the sun like pagans did. But the new pagan object of worship is the self. It's mankind. The goal of the sun hanging in the sky is that we would look up and say, isn't our creator glorious? Isn't the works of his hand, aren't they majestic? The modern man, the modern woman looks up at the sky and sees the sun and says, aren't I wonderful? Aren't I amazing? Isn't it great that I get to do all these great things I get to do? We like to imagine the sun shines each day to show our glory rather than having the humility to recognize God's glory. And friends, this is not just a sin that's out there. We all have the tendency in our hearts to do this day by day, to pretend like we're the center of the universe rather than the fact that we were created for God's glory. 
The scripture is very clear. The natural world exists to declare the majesty of the Lord. And sinful human beings, we tend to think that in order to understand the natural world, we kind of have to get God or religion out of the way in some sense. But friends, the only way the world ever makes sense is if we understand the created world in relation to its creator. Remove the creator from the equation. We'll walk outside and look at the sun and think, aren't I wonderful? Remove the light of nature. Remove the purpose of intelligent design. You remove any hope that the world will make sense at all. The goal is not to examine the creation apart from the knowledge of the creator, but in light of the knowledge of the creator. Charles Spurgeon says it better than I could. He says this, How foolish and wicked are those who, instead of accepting the two sacred tomes and delighting to behold the same divine hand in each, spend all their wits in endeavoring to find discrepancies and contradictions. He is wisest who reads both the world book and the word book as two volumes of the same work and feels concerning them. My father wrote them both. The doctrine of creation and the reality of intelligent design is the most logical explanation for the world in which we live. And both scripture and the created order testify to this reality. We often speak of God's glory in creation as general revelation. We speak of God's glory revealed in scripture as special revelation. That is, everyone everywhere can see the light of nature and should respond accordingly, but... The glorious gospel message is not understood just by looking up at the sun. We might know there is a creator by looking at the sky, but we have to look at the word to know there is a redeemer. That's the second thing that we see in our text, that God reveals himself through scripture. It might seem unnatural that the psalmist goes from singing this song about the sun to singing this song about the Bible. But if we understand his point, what he's getting at, It makes perfect sense. He's trying to help us to understand how we might know our creator. And we know something about God by looking at the light of nature. And we learn much more about God by looking at his word. There's some things we can learn by nature, but there's some other things we can only learn by looking at the word. For example, we might know that murder is wrong by the light of nature. And many in our world do, and we should praise God for that. But... To know how we could be justified before a holy God. We're not going to learn that by looking at the trees or by looking to the clouds. We must learn that by looking to the word. So David uses a highly poetic style here to describe God's form of revelation. In each phrase here, we see the form of revelation, the attributes of revelation, and the effect of it. And these are all Really similar things, kind of like different faces of a diamond, if you would. If you ever examined closely a diamond, you'll see it's all one substance, but each face kind of reveals a different part. So it is with David's description here of the Word of God. So let's examine each face of the diamond here briefly. Look at verse 7. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The word of God is without defect at all. It is perfect. It does not need amendment or updating. And what's the result of considering the law of the Lord? God revives the soul. That's what Romans 10 says, that faith comes by hearing and hearing through the word about Christ. God makes dead things come to life by his word. He breathed life into Adam. He created all of life. And by the preaching of his word, by the reading of his word, he brings those souls which are dead in their trespasses and sins to life. That's why we order our services around the word of God. That's why we want to organize our church according to the word of God. That's why we give attention to the reading and the preaching of the word of God as a church. Because the word of God gives life to the dead. You learn something about God when you look at the sun. But when you look to the word, your very soul is revived. Notice, secondly, there in verse 7. He says, the testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. I love this here. Testimony there is a word which refers to the Ark of the Covenant. And when we think about the Ark of the Covenant, we think about those things contained inside the Ark of the Covenant, namely the Ten Commandments. When we think testimony, we think 
Ten Commandments. Do you want to be wise today? Do you think maybe, oh, I'm not so smart. This theology stuff's not for me. I have a hard time you know, understanding what the Bible says. I'd rather go outside and look at the sun, right? It's more fun for me. You know, the Word of God makes simple people wise, unlearned people wise. To be wise, you don't need an advanced degree. You don't need technological innovation. You don't need to read a thousand books. You need to know Christ. You need to know the Ten Commandments. You need to order your life by them. Simple people become wise when they hear the Word of God. Now, to be clear, keeping the Ten Commandments doesn't save you. The Apostle Paul is clear in the New Testament that he who has broken one part of the law has broken the whole thing, and we're all guilty of breaking the Ten Commandments. But if you are in Christ, if you're in a right relationship with God, the Ten Commandments impart wisdom to you to know how you might live, to love your God and love your neighbor. If we do those things, we'll live wisely in the world God has created. Look at verse 8. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. You can know if you follow the Lord's teaching, you will be doing the right thing. You won't have to wonder whether you're doing what is right or wrong. And in doing the right thing, your heart will find joy. I think this is important to note. The psalmist here is singing a song that's not some lament about how hard and how heavy the law of God is as a burden upon his back. He's singing a, a song expressing how great and how good God's commandments are. Oh, if we, if we would just get that into our heads, that God's rules are good for us. They're not some burden to be cast off, some kind of oppressive constraint upon humanity. God's laws are good for his creation. We see the next line, the commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes God's commandments are not stained by sin. They're not inaccurate. They're not wrong. They are pure. Everything in them is purposely placed there by God. And the effect that this pure command has on one who observes it is that his eyes are enlightened. I don't know about you all, but I have terrible eyesight. I mean, it's just dreadful. If I wear contacts to correct it, but for some reason, if I'm like stumbling around the house without my glasses on my contact, I'm bumping into stuff, I'm screaming, I'm shouting, like I'm, I'm not doing well when my eyes don't see correctly. And I'm thankful that you know, we have correctives for that. I can wear glasses, I can put on contacts, and I can see more clearly. Don't, I can't read that sign in the back of the room on top of the chairs, but the big ones I can get, like the big ones around the room, I can read those. I'm thankful for that. Friends, if we live in this world without seeing it through God's commands, it's like walking around without your glasses. It's like walking around with no contacts. Yeah, you might get some places, but you'll probably get damaged along the way. I sure shouldn't drive without them. And how often do we go through the world thinking, hey, I've got my reason, I've got my intellect, I don't need God's laws. The psalmist instructs us here. Verse number 9. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The fear of the Lord is not a fear of His judgment, but a recognition of His deity. That He is a great God, high above us, and we would do well to listen to Him, to attempt to live rightly before Him. And this fear of God has a cleansing effect in our lives, that we cast away those things which are impure that would lead us to sin, to walk rightly before our great God. Fearing the Lord, recognizing His Lordship leads us to wisdom. And consider finally here that the rules of the Lord are true and righteous all together. If you want to be righteous and live righteously, you must give attention to the rules of the Lord, to the Word of God. On the last day, God will be shown to be right in everything He has ever commanded His people to do. His Word is not wrong. And so... God's people should order their lives after his word. It should be noted here, David speaks here as a Christian, as a follower of the one true God. Christians delight in God's word. I would say one indicator of whether or not you are a Christian is how you respond to God's word. Do you delight in it? Do you desire it? Do you want to be told how you should live in God's world? Or are you skeptical of it? Do you reject it? 
Do you want to change it? The law doesn't change between a believer or a non-believer. But the reaction between a believer and a non-believer to the Word of God is vastly different. Believers welcome the Word of God, the rules of the Lord. While non-believers shun it, want to change it. For the believer, the law is not some horrifying standard to which we know we can never perform. No, for the believer, Jesus Christ has kept the law in your place. And by your faith in Him, by your faith in His work on the cross, that He bore your sins when He died on the tree. By your faith in Christ, we no longer have to fear judgment. We get the joy of walking in righteousness. Since Christ is raised from the dead, when you place your faith in Him, you are given Christ's righteousness. That is, God looks on you as a law keeper, not as a law breaker. Not because you've kept the law, but because Jesus Christ is righteous. So for the Christian, the law of God becomes a faithful guide into righteousness. And as a Christian abides in God's law, he is transformed. That's what David is aiming at here. We see third in our text this morning is that revelation is for transformation. Why does God reveal himself to us? That we might be changed. That our hearts might be opened and awakened to who he is. That our minds might be opened. That we might obey him. Look at verse 10. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and the drippings of the honeycomb. What does every person in the world seem to want? I think you can boil it down to two things. Money and pleasure. And the world tells us that if we can get those two things, then we'll really be happy. Then it will really go well for us. If you can get money and pleasure, money in various shapes, forms, and sizes, and pleasure in various shapes, forms, and sizes, then if you can get those two things, you will be happy. But notice what the psalmist says. That the law of God is more to be desired than gold. Even much fine gold. That's Benjamin's. Right? In our lingo. Even many, many Benjamins, if you want the Drew Byers translation. Right? Would you rather have lots of money for the law of God? I think that's a question we all need to answer. The law of God is better than much fine gold. And you notice also, he says, it's sweeter also than the honey and drippings of the honeycomb. That is, it's sweet to the taste. It is pleasing to us as Christians. Friends, do you believe that? Do you believe that the law of God is that good? Do you believe it's better to obey God and be poor? Do you think it's better to obey God and have His pleasure rather than the world's pleasure? That's what the psalmist directs us to. And let's be clear, our hearts don't naturally conform to this standard. That's why God has revealed Himself to us both in creation and in the Word. Knowing the law, having wisdom is better than being wealthy. Knowing the law, having wisdom is better than having pleasure. In saying this, the psalmist is saying simply that God's laws are very good for us. But in our current climate, rules are the ultimate destroyer of our autonomy. And so rules are are despised. They're cast off. The modern individual says, you can't tell me what to do. I am my own modern person. Friends, that's just a silly way to live. And it's a way that will make sure that you never actually get happiness. David Van Drunen, one theologian, he said this. Many Christians are tempted to view God's law as a bunch of rules that God has imposed on us that keep us from enjoying a lot of fun pleasure, and profit. But God's law isn't arbitrary. It commands what it does for good reasons. God's law not only reflects His own holy and righteous nature, but also reflects our own nature. His moral will corresponds to the way He created us and the purposes He made us to achieve. This means that God's law is hardly a straitjacket constraining us from enjoyable things, God's law is genuinely good for us. That's why we see in verse 11. Moreover, by them is your servant warned. There is reward in heeding God's warning. 
you go to someone's house and they've got a sign on their fence that says, beware of dog, you'd be wise, I think, to heed that sign. Maybe some of you all are like me and you want to pet every dog everywhere, but sometimes there's some dogs that's better off just leave them alone, right? We'd heed that sign that says, beware of dog. And moreover, there's a reward in heeding that song and that, and that, and that sign. You won't get bit. You won't get scratched. What would you do if you saw a sign that said, beware of sin? Would you heed that sign? Or would you look over the gate to see how big is the sin back there? What breed is it? Is it's it a good, good dog, dog or a bad, bad dog? dog? Is it's it a good sin? sin? Is it pleasurable sin? sin? You'd heed the sign, beware, beware of the dog, dog, so you wouldn't get bitten. Would, would you heed God's word that says, beware, beware of sin? sin? But you, you might, might not face a fate, fate much worse than the bite of an angry dog. dog. If, if avoiding the bite of a dog, dog is good for your body, body avoiding the poison of sin is one of the very best things you can do for your soul. And God's word warns us of the dangers of sin. It's precisely why God has given us his word. It leads to verse, tw- verse 12. The psalmist says, who can discern his errors? That means who can look at God's law and say, no, that line, that's wrong. No, this part, this part is not correct. No, this, this one statue, it's not good for human beings. No one can look at the word of God and say God is wrong. Because this is his world. So his rules govern it. You'll never find a fault in God. But for, for me... Well, Well, I've got got faults faults I don't even know about yet. Look Look at the the second line of verse 12. Declare Declare me innocent from hidden faults. That is, I have sin in my heart that that has not even been exposed yet. yet. Who Who am I to make a comment on whether or not God's laws are good? Because I'm not good. I have a skewed judgment. How can I make a right judgment about the law of the Lord? We need to be declared innocent from Hidden faults, things that we don't even know we've done wrong yet. But look at verse 13. We also have presumptuous sins that we need to avoid. Presumptuous sins are sins where we know what the right thing is to do and we do the wrong thing anyway. Presumptuous sins are those kinds of sins I warn about when we do communion. Those habitual, unrepentant sins. Presumptuous sins are sins that we do knowing firmly in our heart that we shouldn't. And... The psalmist here tells us that if we consider the law of God, we would be kept back from presumptuous sins, from willful sin. That's because Scripture changes our desires, changes our hearts to be in line with what God has created us to be. St. Augustine again says this, If you are a Christian, do not be afraid of any human tyrant outside yourself, but fear the Lord your God always. Fear the evil within you. Your own unruly desires. Not what God created in you, but what you have made of yourself. God made you a good servant, but you have set up an evil master for yourself in your own heart. We should, rather than discern the law of God and see if there's anything wrong with God's law, we should certainly discern our own hearts and see where they, where our hearts are out of step with what God has commanded us. Notice what effect that has on us. David says, Then I shall be blameless, innocent against, innocent of great transgression. Heeding the word of God will keep you from great sin. And avoiding great sin will keep you out of misery. Friends, we've been given a weapon against Satan's devices. We've been given the word of God. When Jesus was tempted in the wilderness by the devil, do you know where he turned? He turned to his Old Testament. He turned to the book of Deuteronomy. And in knowing the word and in proclaiming the word to the devil, the devil fled from him. The devil knew there's nothing wrong in God's word. There's nothing I can say against it. All he can seek to do is to twist it or to convince you that it's not really true. We have a precious, precious tool against Satan's devices. And we should heed it. Which is why David ends the psalm the way he does. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart Be acceptable in your sight, 
O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. What does David want from contemplating the creation and contemplating the written word? He wants his heart and his mouth to be changed. His heart and his mouth to be acceptable in God's sight. That when we look at the created world around us and see that we have a creator who has made us and calls us to obey him. And when we look at the word of God and see who Jesus Christ is, it changes our hearts and it changes our mouths and it changes our disposition on who this life is to be lived for. And we see, I'm not the center of the universe. God is the center of the universe. Jesus Christ is the righteous one. I live for him. And friends, there is more joy in this disposition than the world could ever promise you. God's revelation is for transformation, that our hearts and minds be transformed to live in conformity with our creator and our redeemer. God's given us two books to read. As Spurgeon said, the word book and the world book. And we should read them both. And we should read them both often. And know our creator who has has created them for us. And know our redeemer. Know the Lord Jesus Christ who has died so that we might receive new hearts. That the words of our mouths and the meditation of our hearts might be acceptable in God's sight. It's my prayer for us as a church.